talk a little more generally about uh, Riverdale. Um, and, you know, I, I made a title of Are They the Canary in the Coal Mine for, for Climate Change? And in, I'll give you the answer now. It's no. Um, there has been so much anthropogenic change that we've done to deltas that climate change is a secondary problem compared to the problems we've already produced. Um, so start with a, a big picture of, if you think of, a, of the river systems up in the mountains in the hinterland, um, your erode sediments and the water and the sediments are flowing down through the river system to the coast. And then often as the river goes into a stand water, it drops the sediment and, and produces deposits. And some of those still continue even farther um, down into the deep basin. Rivers tend to form what are called dendritic networks, uh, where you see these tributaries will all join together into a main trunk. And then when they reach the river mouth, they start spreading out into many branches. So similar to uh, a tree, and so they're called that. Um, and the archetypical delta is the Nile Delta, where you can see the uh, river coming up and spreading out into this broad uh, delta. And in fact, um, the Nile is what gave us the name Delta. Uh, the view from ancient Greece of the Nile Delta was like this. And so Herodotus thought that this looked like the Greek letter Delta and the origin of the name uh, Delta. And, um, you know, so, you know, rivers, many of them have deltas around their mouth and particularly some of the large rivers bring in a huge amount of, of sediments and tend to dominate sediments. Um, and you can see over here, you know, a map of all the deltas around the world where most of them are very small, but um, of them, I think I'll talk about Ganges Brahmaputra, the yellow, uh, the Mississippi, the Amazon, um, you know, bring down a huge amount of sediments draining uh, very large parts of the interior of the continents. And deltas come in, in all sizes. So the delta that formed in a, in a mine, uh, out of mine tailings in Hibbing, Minnesota, where Bob Dylan is from. Um, here's the Tahomish Delta in, uh, in the Puget Sound. Here's uh, the one I've been working on for the last 20 years, the world's largest, which is the, the Brahmaputra, which is several hundred kilometers across. Um, and then here on uh, this island here is a little tidal with a little delta at the base of it that's only about two feet across. Um, so they come in all sizes. Um, but of course, delta is always at this boundary between the river and the ocean or, or even a lake. Um, they tend to form a very flat lying with many channels, very dynamic, um, but they're also very close to uh, sea level. And as a result, um, they're very sensitive to changes in, for instance, sea level rise or the land subsiding, how the supply changes. And so they're a very you know, vulnerable area um, that is a, a good way of looking at how the balance of, of things are, are happening in the world. And uh, the way I tend to look at it is, this will be the only equation I'll show, uh, that basically the effective sea level rise that you see at a delta obviously is, is due to you know, how sea level is changing. But the other thing is that deltas, and I'll explain this more in the future, are subsiding through both uh, natural and human-induced causes. And that makes the sea level rise even worse because the land is going down as well as the water surface going up. And what balances that out is the sediment that the river brings out to try and fill that space. And so depending on how any of these change, deltas can either grow or, we get, or get eroded and, 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 or submerged. 
So I'm going to do so first for for sea level rise. You know, we we know that um, over the last, for instance, hundreds of thousands of years, um, through the ages, sea level has gone up and down. But also, you can see carbon dioxide levels have gone up and down between about 280 in the uh, glacials and and down around 200 or a little lower in the uh, glacial stages. And currently, with the industrial, um, it has uh, skyrocketed to 412. Every time I give this talk, I have to check what the current level of sea is, and I keep on having to revise it upwards. With COVID this time, I did not have to revise it upwards. Um, and there are very models about what the effect of the rise of CO2 on climate change will be. And um, I mean, these are a bit of old project, but they serve the purpose where, you know, in these colored bands are projections of sea level rise and the red line is the observations. And you can see that the projections of the temperature change have fit fairly well with the models. But on this side, if you look at projections of sea level rise um, versus the observations, what you can see is that the sea level rise is running along the high of all the projections. So it's, it's even worse than, than the center of the, of the estimates. But when people often look at the impact of sea level rise, um, what they tend to do um, is use a very static model. They take the current topography and just raise sea level. And you can see that here for Bangladesh, where you know, they rise, raise sea level a meter and a half, that you know, percent of the country will be underwater and it will displace a large amount of the population. I think an extreme example of this from uh, this paper looking at tiger habitats in the Sundarbans mangrove forest in Bangladesh, in southwestern Bangladesh, where they again took a static um, and raised sea level. And they said, you know, the land is disappear, fragmenting, and the tigers will disappear. This is, is currently the world's largest um, um, area of, of tigers, 500 uh, tigers living, living in there. But these are not accurate because they're not taking into account the fact that of, of, of subsidence and sedimentation and, and the dynamic changes that happen within these river systems. So, um, so now I'd like to go through and look a little bit more about um, changes in subsidence and sedimentation in, in various deltas around the world. So for subsidence, um, there are a lot of causes that can make the land uh, sink. There are certainly tectonics, um, where you have lots of sediments, particularly at, at a delta. Um, you get compaction of various scales from you know, deep uh, compaction, which can be halted by overpressure. Um, additional processes that can go on in the near surface, you know, especially as I'll, I'll talk about if there are um, the weight of the sediments can also produce um, isostatic loading. That simply the weight of the sediment pushes the land down, and that uh, um, also induces subsidence. And and people, of course, pull out both drinking water and oil out of the ground. And by withdrawing those fluids, you can also produce a large amount of, of subsidence in, in places. So for instance, you know, you think of uh, in isostatic loading, the ice sheets, for instance, when we, age, we grew big ice sheets, they push down on the land, it subsided and moves out of the way. You know, since the end of the ice sheet uh, removed, the land is now uh, rebounding. But this process of the land bending and and the mantle flowing is slow. So, you know, it takes thousands of years. So for instance, Hudson Bay, uh, which was the center of the American ice sheet and the Gulf of Bothnia in the Baltic Sea was the center of the Fennoscandian ice sheet, are still 
underwater and still thousands of years after uh, the end of the ice age. And so these are some estimates not done by, by me, um, by some of my, my colleagues showing that just in Bangladesh, the weight of the sediments that have been deposited on the delta have pushed the land down. And on this one are continuing to push the land down, contributing um, to a millimeter, millimeter and a half a year of subsidence. Um, so even if you stopped all the sediment now, they would still continue to sink for thousands of years. And sediment compaction is then when the sediments do come into the delta, uh, they tend to be deposited, you know, mud or sand with a lot of uh, water and pore space. And as sediments get piled on top of them, they tend to get uh, squeezed, the water gets squeezed out, they get compacted, you know, eventually to a, a sedimentary rock with very little pore space. You can see that if you look at sediment uh, porosity versus depth. Um, this is one particular compilation uh, by Michelle Comin, um, where you can see at near surface, very high uh, porosities that most of the deposit is water uh, uh, and much less of it is a solid rock. And as you, as they get buried, the water gets squeezed out. And as you're squeezing that out, the rock is taking up less volume and producing subsidence. And that water getting out can also take thousands, tens of thousands, deep water, even you know, hundreds of thousands of years for it to um, go out. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so it, it's you know, long-term processes that keep uh, subsidence going after you stop depositing sediments. Uh, and for the near surface um, problems of compaction, I think the best example looking at um, Holland in, uh, or the Netherlands at the mouth of the, of the Rhine Delta, where what they say is God created the world, but the Dutch created Holland, where they've uh, totally transformed the world. And I had only realized recently that in fact, the Netherlands is actually the number two country in the world in terms of agricultural exports after the US. So um, in the Netherlands, what happened is uh, when sea level rose um, after the last, um, uh, last deglaciation, you know, it formed a, a barrier system similar to what you see offshore, you know, sort of the southern coast of Long Island or the east coast of New Jersey with uh, back bays behind it. And those bays were filled with organic rich sediment that became peat. And so if you take a, a cross section, you see are various sandy beach ridges here, but behind there's a huge amount of, of peat, uh, which is very organic rich sediment and very heavy, heavy sediments. Um, and, you know, if you go back in time, in fact, you know, Northern and Northwestern Europe was somewhat of a backwater in ancient times. You think of, you know, when you go back 2000 years, you think Mediterranean as the center of civilization and not the, the North. Um, what changed that, uh, once the development of um, the heavy plow, which was a, a, a plow usually uh, by a team, much larger team of oxen and worked by two people with a, a heavy, heavy metal board that turned the soil over. And that allowed people to farm um, much more effectively the uh, heavy organic rich soils in Northwestern Europe. Um, but, um, in, you know, but those were still very, you know, heavy, it's very wet areas, putting in drainage ditches to, to drain it. And one of the problems is 
as they drain the land um, for agriculture, um, they lower the water level and expose the peats that underlie the land to air. Uh, the organic matter oxidizes and that causes subsidence. Um, and because of that, land was then sink, it could become waterlogged again. They started putting up the famous windmills to drain it further. Um, but draining it further produced more subsidy. It only then went to mechanical uh, pumps and you know coal-fired pumps and 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 various other you know pumps and and dikes to protect the land, which is now uh, mostly below sea level. So um, what you see in, in terms of the elevation in the Netherlands is that it went from above sea level and through the system of dike building and windmills and drainage, um, while sea level is going up, the land has, has gone down through time over the last thousand years. You know, take a look here is for instance, a uh, a barn and you can see the land surface is no longer the base of the bomb, but you can see the piling it's built exposed. Um, and you can take a look and see the, the subsidence here is um, essentially uh, uh, corresponds to where the peat basins are and the uh, elevation here, all these blue areas, all these colored areas are actually below, uh, the blues and greens and yellows are actually below and being protected. You know, so you went from um, cultivating the land um, and it lowering and lowering its, now much of the land is below sea level and protected by an effective uh, dike system to uh, protect it, but even with, Global rise and change in climate, even the Dutch have had to start to adjust, you know, for that. So for instance, in their room for the river project, it's this island in the, uh, in the Rhine um, is now set up where they've taken down the large dikes that protected it with smaller dikes um, and raised the level of the farms that you see here. Um, so that if there is a major flood in the river, this land, will, this farm will all get submerged while the homes stay above the, uh, the flood level. As in this picture on here, here's the, the tree covered farms are above, but the, uh, but the land absorbs the water to protect the city stream from, uh, from flooding. Okay. Another aspect of rivers that's really is the development of, of levees that um, rivers commonly flood um, every few years or every year. And when the water level goes up and the river goes past it banks, its banks, um, the water flows down and will drop its load of sediments, uh, coarser sediments closer and finer grain sediments um, farther away. And as a result, they will naturally build up levees on either side of the river. Um, so this is what you, you tend to see in a river that you get sand going to fine sand, so clay into the bottom land that's farther, farther down. Um, when there are bends in rivers often on the outer side is higher than the levee on the inner side. Um, and you can see in this picture from Bangladesh, where you can see the, um, you know, all the, the green in here, uh, is deeper green are trees, um, and those are where the village are. And you can see these various, you know, arcuate shapes. These are former courses of the river. So the river, this river, you flow through here, um, and this was the levee, and then it moved farther east and develop new levees. And because the levee naturally higher land, that's where all the villages are in this part of, the, of, of Bangladesh. And so when there is a flood, the fields will flood, but the villages have, 
having naturally higher elevation remain remain dry. And you can see, you know, the degree of the river motion by looking at the pattern of, of the land. Um, and of course, if you remember Hurricane Irina, you can think of the Mississippi River. Um, so, you know, on the bottom, you can see a topographic map showing here's the Mississippi River and the red is the high ground, which are the levees, and on either side of it is much, you know, lower ground. What we've done with time is we've taken the natural levees and built artificial levees that are higher to protect it from, from flooding and stop it from flooding at all. Um, but that, you know, causes a problem because um, that land outside the river is no longer receiving sediment. And even worse, it has the same problem as in the Netherlands. Uh, because that land is low and subsiding, um, they've put in pumps to drain the land. And that pump, those pumps have caused exposure of the um, peat to air causing it to oxidize and about 85% of the um, volume goes up as carbon dioxide and water. And so if you take a look at a cross section across New Orleans now, see that New Orleans, well, New Orleans sits below sea level uh, with levees protecting it from um, the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain. Not a very stable situation. And that came about, um, after the great flood of 1927, you can see here a huge stretch of the Mississippi River from, um, you know, from Missouri all the way down to the coast was, was flooded. So this is already, you know, you know, hundreds of miles upstream, you know, flooded. Uh, in 1927, it was a, a, a dramatic, extensive flood. And uh, in thinking about, you know, what to do to cope with it, um, you can see an old cartoon. Um, they decided to, to enlarge the levee system. Um, and so, you know, over time, they've just continuously enlarged the levee system on either side. And um, in the lowlands, now felt protected because there were these very strong, hardened levees on either side of the Mississippi River. Oops. And that's when people started to move and populate uh, some of the lower elevation areas on, in, in New Orleans. Um, but, you know, of course, that didn't stop the land from subsiding. This is uh, some INSAW data showing that there is still subsiding. Um, you know, especially as you go farther away from the river where it's muddier fairly rapidly. And you can see here elevation, and here's the areas that were flooded during Hurricane Katrina. So things like the Lower Ninth Ward uh, that were famously, these are all the areas that were basically, you know, unpopulated um, until after the levees were built in 1927. But of course, with the uh, continued subsidence of the land, those levees could not protect um, as well as they could when they were when they were first. Um, there were other issues as 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 well, um, but some areas like you know the old parts of the city, like the French and the Garden District and around Tulane University, were built on the levees and at higher elevations, and so those often wealthier parts of the city stayed dry while the poorer parts of the city um, at lower elevation flooded. And you know, so here you can see one of the homes that was destroyed. Um, these are some of the rebuilt uh, Brad Pitt houses because he raised the money for that. We put them on, on stilts uh, to protect them. Unfortunately, these houses as a result have now become so expense, ex expensive that the people who live in the Lower Ninth Ward can't afford them anymore. And here's a picture uh, from a few years ago with Alec Coco leading a, a tour of the rebuilt levee 
and you can see the levee, of course, has uh, is built, you know, with quite deep and, but the um, the sidewalk built along the side of it is continuing to subside, and so just, you know, years after, I think this is in 2013, so eight years later, you can still see um, a couple of inches of pins that has. Um, that has continued on the on the land. Mm -hmm. and one another consequence of rivers uh, building up uh, levees to the river and and not having sediment farther away is that you know the levees and the whole river system will keep getting elevated through time um, until you know, eventually sometime, if it becomes what's called super elevated, where the river is actually higher than away from the river, um, if there's a crevasse play of a, a flood where the river breaks its bank, it may decide that it likes that path that's lower elevation better and not return. And that is a uh, operating procedure at a, at a delta. So here you can see over the last, you know, four or 5,000 years, the history of um, what are called river emulsions of the switches of the rivers in the Mississippi Delta. You know, so that, you know, for instance, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, this was the river, was the river Delta, the St. Bernard, and then about 1,000 years ago, it switched uh, and came down to the La Fourche Delta, and then recently it switched and formed the Birdfoot Delta, uh, the current Delta. And in fact, right now, the Mississippi River would switch and move into this, back into this channel of, in the Atchafalaya River. So um, you know, here's the, the Mississippi River. And this is the Atchafalaya River, where um, there is actually, you can see the Wax Lake Delta is actually down in here. Um, and what's happening is there's a, a massive old river control structure that to keep the river flowing down the current Mississippi and by law is not allowed to let more than 30% of the flow of the river go to Atchafalaya River. Um, and so, you know, it, it hasn't failed yet, but it's come close sometimes. And so right now, you can see how much longer this path is to the sea than this one. The river would really like to change, but, you know, that would end in New Orleans and all the industry along the Mississippi River. And so uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is forcibly holding the river in place. And you know, you can see the, that water and sediment that's coming down um, is, is actually growing this lake delta. You know, so since 1980, it's, it's grown a, a hundred kilometers, square kilometers of new land continuing to, to grow. Um, now, you know, I've been talking about what's happening at the river, but, you know, Mississippi and other rivers um, there's even a bigger problem upstream, which is dams. So, for instance, here's a history of dam building in the U.S. Um, by year, and you can see how the population of uh, and in the 20th century, the amount of dams that have been built. I think there were about 80,000 dams. Yes. Now, some of these have completely sedimented up behind the dams and the dams are no longer useful, but it's a tremendous amount. Um, you can see this picture, um, all of these, uh, all the black or all these reservoirs behind the dams. After the Dust Bowl, I think home and dammed every river they could find uh, to prevent it, it, it happening again. And this is for the world. Now, these are only that are at least 15 meters high. 
So these are just the really large dams. And you can see the US is, is a leader. Um, you see a few in, in, in Japan, a little bit in, in Europe and, and India. But now as we wrote, reach the end of the 19th century, you start seeing them a bit more. And then watch, you can see Europe growing and watch what happens when uh, China uh, goes in a second and So, you know, we have dammed a huge percentage of the world's rivers. And one of the things that that's done is produce a decrease in the amount of sediment that's, a, that's reaching the, the sea. You can see in, in, in black and red are places where, you know, most of the sediment is being trapped. Um, and on this chart, you can see this is 1950 to 2000 but all those places are in red, are places where the sediment discharge has been de has decreased by over percent over that, over that time period. And so for instance, for the Mississippi River, here is a, an estimate of the sediment. Um, so the thickness of the river is the amount of suspended sediment load. Uh, you can see the Missouri River is the major source coming down and there's on the order of 400 million tons of sediment coming down the river. By 1980, most of the Missouri has been dammed and, and cut down that. You see some things like the Ohio River as a result of uh, coal mining and deforestation, you see an increase in sediment load, um, as does the upper Mississippi River. But overall, you're looking at maybe half the amount of sediment um, at best um, coming down the river system. You know, as a result, um, you know, Mississippi River is in um, pretty bad shape um, and is, is undergoing substantial land loss because, as I show, that compaction and the isostatic loading continue even after the river switches. The area that's fastest subsiding is the La Fouche Delta, where here was the old course of the Mississippi River. And this is the area, because it was the most recent, um, River Delta is subsiding most rapidly. And you can see the bird's foot is just a skeleton of its former self. Um, now, I will say that um, the state of Louisiana has set up a monitoring system looking at sedimentation and subsidence um, and, and they make lots of measurements at this, these sites of the crim sites of which what I'm particularly interested in are these things which rod surface elevation tables where they put uh, a deep rod up to about 80 feet and then use it to measure toad elevation changes and I'll show more about that and measure sediment accumulation. And, you know, I'll skip over the, the details, but what you can see is all this blue suggesting that um, the, the amount of sedimentation not keeping up with the, the subsidence in the land. And there is a net loss uh, going on. Um, right now, plans, uh, the Mississippi Delta include perhaps breaching the levee in number of places, like this is one of them for the mid barrett diversion, where they will breach the levee um, and allow the sediment to flow and, and try to save some of the, of the land. So here is what it is, and hopefully grow, start growing new land. But of course, how quickly the land will grow depends on how fast the land is also subsiding from and as a result of this new sediment. And to measure that, we have just south of that in Myrtle Grove, uh, oh, before I, I'll talk about Myrtle Grove in a second. So the idea is uh, to basically abandon that bird's foot and try to make a smaller living delta that's supplied with sediment. The amount of sediment coming down is less than Mississippi Delta can, is not sustainable as the same size as it used to be. So what they need to do 
is other sediment to go into the delta, and even then you still need to cut back and have a smaller delta. Um, and so what we have is a series of um, optical fiber strain meters that measure, directly measure compaction um, and GPS during the, the subsidence that we've installed. And right now we're basically not seeing very much compaction going on because you know there's almost no thing deposited. Um, but once that diversion happens, we expect to start seeing a lot of compaction going on in instruments if we can keep them running. You know, some of them were damaged by Hurricane Bar Barry, but they've survived uh, this year's hurricanes. Uh, it's even worse in the Colorado River, where um, at this point, there is basically no water reaching the river mouth. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, some of the water is being used for places like Los Angeles and Denver and areas outside the, the catchment. Um, and, if, and if each state took the total amount of water that it claims to be entitled to, it would probably be more like the amount of water flowing in the river. Uh, and in fact, uh, by the time with all the irrigation, it gets down to the border, actually you have to desalinate the uh, river before it goes into Mexico. Uh, because by law, we're supposed to deliver a certain amount of water of maximum salinity. And then the rest of that water is used in irrigation in Mexico. And you know, so where it's irrigated, it looks like that. And where it's not, it's just completely dry. And you can see you know, with the drought, you know, Lake Mead is an exposing land. And so, you know, the expect is that, you know, the prediction is that the water use is going to be increasing and the water is, you know, perhaps actually with climate change probably decreasing even more than this and definitely running into, into a serious problem of wartage in the, in the Western U.S. All right. And so now for the rest of the talk, I'm going to uh, switch over to the, the east. Uh, where well, you can see there's also a lot of agriculture and major rivers that come out of, of the Tibetan plateau, ranging from the Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra, uh, Mekong, Yangtze, Yellow River, the Huangli, the Irrawaddy, uh, so that, you know, on the order of 25% of the world sediment is coming out of, the, out of uh, Tibet and the Himalayas. Um, and as quickly mentioned, the Indus is similar to the Colorado River, where essentially um, all of the water is being used for irrigation in Pakistan now. And there's nothing reaching the sea, almost nothing reaching the sea. Um, the Mekong is also in, in pretty bad shape. Um, it's low elevation, uh, can go. And uh, because of groundwater extraction for uh, uh, for agriculture is producing uh, subsidence, as you can see here on some of the INSAR, these uh, yellows, and mining of the sand in the river um, for construction, for making concrete. Uh, in fact, that there's a, a net loss of, of, of sand from the river for construction that's larger than the amount that's coming here. Um, and as a result, as you go along the coast, particularly at the, the southern part, um, there's a serious erosion going on because there is not enough sediment to keep this, keep this going at present. Um, then there are a whole series of dams planned and being constructed along the Mekong River. Um, there are some in China, but particularly in, uh, in Laos are being planned. And here are some calculations um, that were done for, depending on uh, dams would get built, where you can see between 51 and 96% of the sediment being trapped before it reaches the delta. And yeah, update essentially those dams are going on and there's more and more being built. Um, 
on a yellow river before I go to Bangladesh. Here you can see why it was called the Yellow River with all the, the sediment, um, where it runs through and then comes out of the highlands here into the North China Plain. And that river in historic times also evokes Mississippi, sometimes flowing to the south of the Shandong uh, Peninsula and sometimes to the north. And finally, in 1855, uh, the Chinese levied it in to uh, keep it in place, uh, where the river is now um, having grown, having with all the sediment, having to raise the levees higher and higher each year. The levee is now well above um, the river. Here, where it comes out, here's the city of, of Kaifeng um, in the Yellow River. And you can see this profile where here's the Yellow River and the levees, he's six meters, and here's the city at 72. So if this ever breaches, that river is under, that city is underwater. Uh, meanwhile, there is still, you know, some sediment coming out and growing the delta, the smaller delta at the mouth, uh, continuing to uh, uh, produce like 22 kilometers of land, where kilometers of land a year. Um, and in fact, for human impact on the river, what you see is from ancient times, the amount of uh, sediment coming down greatly increased due to um, forestation and agriculture. Um, and then in 1960, there was a major dam, dam opened, and between the dam and uh, better soil conservation and precipitation decrease, the sediment flow has decreased back to about what it was pre. All right, and so now the last part of the talk, I will focus on the work I've been doing in the Ganges River. Um, so, you know, like many of the, of, you know, the largest river, some of the largest rivers in the, outside of the Amazon come out of, um, Tibet and the Himalayas. And in Bangladesh, we have two of them, the Ganges and Brahmaputra, which come to a single delta. And as a result, it's the largest delta in the world with over a billion tons of sediment. It's something on the order of six to 8% of the total river sediment in, in, in the world. Um, and so the Ganges and the Brahmaputra together um, drain about three quarters of the um, Himalayas. Okay. And, you know, it makes for um, a huge delta, really flat and low elevation. Uh, the slope is about 10 to the minus 5. So, um, you know, and, and about half the land is below 10 meters above sea level. Um, as a result, it's extremely fertile. Um, so you can see here, some of the, 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 particularly rice is grown a lot, but just show you here is in the Northeast of Bangladesh, to let you know there is some topography and, and highlands in, in Bangladesh. It's not all Delta. Uh, but, and one of the things Bangladesh is hit by is the monsoon. Um, so the rainfall is extremely seasonal. So you can see here um, some Google Earth images where here is in the dry season where you can see all this green of rice being. And then here in the adjacent image um, is, in, is in the wet season and um, all this dark area is all water. And basically the land is basically the levee system along the river and the roads. Uh, and you can see um, from a little bit, you know, um, upstream of, of this map, um, in some here is the river, a river gauge. So this is 12 meters. So what you see is, and this is five years across, and you can see the water level going up there and back down. And the switch is on the order of seven, eight, nine meters. And so here you can see, uh, this town, Mulganj. Here it is in the winter, uh, this was in, in February, where we had to 
walk down the river channel and take a ferry across back up the other side. Here it is in September where the water level is now right up to street level. Uh, this building is this building here. So, the, so, you know, about an eight meter change between the summer and winter and water level. Um, you can see that in the river. So here's an image of the satellite image of the uh, Brahmaputra River in February. And here it is in August on the year, Oops. where it's gone from um, a series of anastomosing channels into just solid water, 10 kilometers. Um, and the flooding that you see, there's certainly flooding along the river. This part of Bangladesh basically becomes a lake every summer. But all this speckled um, blue is the fields being flooded, but the villages being um, safe. And in the year, 20 to 30 percent of Bangladesh is underwater, but that's primarily the rice fields. However, sometime when there's a bad flood, um, especially this year, um, the maximum has been on the order of 60 to 70 percent of the of the country at times has been underwater. Uh, and just to give you a, a magnet, a scale for how big this river is, here's New York City. Here's the Brahmaputra. So it's called the Bangladesh at the same scale. So not quite as wide as, as New York City, but almost. Um, and, um, and it also has uh, what we saw in other places that the sediments stay mostly close to the river um, and grow. And as a result, to fill all of the land, the river switches. So, um, for instance, a thousand years ago, the Ganges River went down through the area we're now Calcutta, and around the 1600s, it started uh, to switch to running farther farther east. The Brahmaputra actually ran farther east than it used to, and around 1800, it switched to its current course, um, where it reoccupies a small river called the Jamuna, so people call this the Jamuna in Bangladesh. But if you notice, in the 19th century, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra still had set, um, uh, separate paths to the sea. And it's only in the late 1900s that the two combined to form one river mouth. So, um, you know, a lot of dramatic movements of the river, including in, in you know, relatively recent. Um, and working with Steve Goodbread has drilled, you know, hundreds of wells in Bangladesh and has mapped out different paths of the Brahmaputra and showed that during the Holocene, uh, the river has has shifted positions at least five times back and forth between Western Pathway and one of these two more easterly pathways. Um, and that's influenced by some of the tectonics around here where this saline um, subsides rapidly, attracts the river, the river flows, fills it up, and it jumps back out. And, um, and at times there are large earthquakes here that can also influence that. Um, so Celine Graal, who I worked with, took a lot of these wells. Here is a map of these wells that have been drilled and used that to calculate what the long-term, looking at the Holocene sediment record, um, accidents. And what we see is here is a hidden zone that's essentially the edge of the Indian Craton, and this is the uh, thick sediment subsiding continental margin. Um, with sediments up to 20 kilometers thick. And what you see is from the hin zone, the sediment, uh, the subsidence increasing to about four and a half millimeters a year. Uh, so higher than the rate of sea level rise as you go towards the coast. Um, and, you know, as a result of that um, subsidence and the distribution of sediments, um, you know, some parts of the basin are not getting enough sediment. We saw that this area becomes a lake every, every year, air is subsiding and not getting the sediment. So the sediment comes through the river and deposits close to the river, 
when it goes out, actually goes onto the shelf and some of the sediment back and feed the Sundabans um, and feed the land um, onshore up until it reaches the, uh, a canyon at it's called the swatch of no ground. So then when you go farther west into India, um, there's very little sediment. Um, and, you know, sediment as a result is still by the river mouth is still growing. So here you can see if you go into Google Earth and zoom in, um, what will is a coastline. That's the 1943 coastline. And you can see the current image where all of these islands are now coalesced to as part of the mainland. Um, and what's actually happening is this channel is actually decreasing in size. This is the channel Ganges used to go through but no longer does. And now the combined Ganges and Brahmaputra flow down this channel, which is enlarging. Um, this sediment came as a result of the 1950 earthquake upstream in Assam, India, which brought an estimated 10 times the annual yield of the, of the river. And so here are estimates looking at coastline changes. You can see what I said that this channel, um, the channel is silting up while the main Meghna channel is enlarging. Um, you know, recent times because of that earthquake is growing faster. This is an historic time looking over um, the last um, 150 years and you can see still, you know, land and then as you go along the coast, you begin to see um, erosion of the, of the coast. Um, but it's, it's relatively in Bangladesh, by the time you reach India, you run out of sediment and it's, it's much worse. And if you take a look, here's in the Sundabans in both Bangladesh here, yeah, in Bangladesh, what I see is um, the river is, is very muddy. When the, when the tides go, you can see a fresh layer of, of shiny sediment on the, on the channels. And here in India, you can see it bare, roots sticking out, this is loading uh, badly. Uh, and just uh, the kicks, here's a picture of some of the mangrove trees where you can see that even bottom of the trees is due to the grazing line of deers. That's as high as a deer can reach. And so it nicely follows it. Um, and these are some tiger footprints. And so you can see what the topography looks like in this garishly covered example where you can low area um, that's inland that's over here not getting enough sediment and is the lowest elevation. Uh, this is pretty high because of the tree cover, but it's still you know higher um, along the coast than farther inland until you reach India. Um, to cope with that in Bangladesh, they built embankments around a lot of the islands in the interior of the of the delta. They used the Dutch term pole to um, improve agriculture, and you can see it's been effective at doing that. Um, the problem is that those engines that are now, you know, 50 years old, 50, 60 years old, um, have also kept the interior from flooding and flooding sediment. And um, as a result, the land inside is lower than the land outside. And um, as a result, a lot of the land has been switching from uh, rice farming to shrimp farming as the land sinks, and you have problems of salinization um, as well from saltwater intrusion. Uh, and, uh, and one problem with just being protected by embankments is um, this area called Polder 32 where uh, Cyclone Isla in 2009 breached the embankment in several places. And this is a picture of it actually a year after. This, um, it was flooded for most of two years um, because the, it was, it was, uh, the embankment was breached. They repaired the and it failed in the next monsoon and it got flooded again. And it wasn't until two years after that they uh, did it. So here you can see a picture um, before and after, uh, and here's a, a 
just a close up of the flooded lands uh, inside the island. And the problem is, is that the land inside the embankment is lower than outside. So we did a GPS survey and you can see here is the, here is the embankment. Here is the land outside the embankment at the same level as the Sundamans mangrove forest, but the land inside is a meter to a half below um, its natural level. As a result, when it was uh, produced an average of 20 uh, centimeters per year of sediment inside. Uh, it was uncontrolled. So, uh, so, you know, people are now trying to adapt that to use um, opening the loose gates during the summer to allow sediments in um, to try and rebuild the land. And that's called tidal river, river management. Um, and you can see here, um, earlier this year in May, uh, super cyclone Amphan uh, and did the same thing, breached embankments, caused major widespread flooding in the western part of Bangladesh and, and West Bengal. Uh, and so uh, the last piece of the, of the talk, I'll talk about my work on, uh, there's currently a embankment improvement project to try and rebuild um, a set of these um, subset of these embankments, and I'm part of um, a program to try and um, understand this interaction of subsidence, river shifting, sediment supply rise. Um, and my particular part is looking at the uh, at the subsidence, try and design sustainable polders for the future. So as a result. Um, we started looking at much shorter term um, um, subsidence. We've used some tide gauges, used uh, historic sites, um, such as this is a, a 400 year old Hindu temple and a, a, a salt kiln for salt production that's about 300 years old. And here's a GPS, this one's actually on pole to 32 on a, on a school building where we have then a GPS receiver and batteries and, and various things to control it. And so uh, over the years, I've been in uh, GPS around Bangladesh, mostly to look at uh, the tectonics in the eastern part of the country, but now a whole set in the west, in the west to look at the, at the subsidence where, so last year we put in four new stations and, and, and fixed some of the um, old that weren't working as well. And so what a, a GPS does um, is it is unlike the GPS in your phone, the GPS we have can measure positions to about two millimeters accuracy each day um, in the horizontal, about six millimeters in the vertical. And so you can see this picture from Dhaka University in my field clothes. Um, here's this antenna. This is, well, we can't read, this is from 2003 through 2014, and this is, you know, hundreds of millimeters, and you can see the antenna slowly moving this off and east, and this is the vertical, and you can see the land subsiding with a large seasonal component due to the months. So last year we traveled around, Here you can see, um, a UNAFCO engineer, John Galetska, with one of the antennas. Here I am with where with the box we kept the receivers in on top of a unused toilet. Uh, we traveled around about half the time by boat. Here you can see Carol Wilson in the middle of a big crowd installing uh, surface elevation tables close to my GPS. So those surface elevation tables I showed a picture of before. Um, and you can see installing them in the rain. Uh, and what you do is on these, uh, so you have a, a rod that's driven to refusal and then you attach this top pot to measure in detail the elevation change. So here you can see Carol at one of them attaching this rod and um, they just touch the ground and she measures 
the nine rods in eight different positions. They're staying on a board so they don't touch the ground. You capture the elevation differences. And then here's a, a tile that's buried to measure the sedimentation rate. Um, here you can see one of her completed surface elevation tables. And here's a GPS that I installed on a rod just like hers. Um, the rod up and down past this is just a, a cylinder. So, so this can, can go down and is just to stabilize it. Because most of my GPS are on buildings. And the question is, uh, on the buildings, do I miss some of the shallow subsidence? And so the surface elevation, elevation change, sediment accretion, and as a result, the difference is the subsidence. Um, and so uh, we have uh, nine GPS and uh, 22 surface elevation tables. The surface elevation table is only um, um, installed in pairs, both inside and outside of the embankments. Uh, and the thing is that the surface elevation table, of course, only measures the subsidence above the base of the rod, whereas the GPS, the total subsidence. So the combination becomes very powerful. Unfortunately, with only one year and COVID stopping us from going out into the field, uh, we don't have enough data yet from those new sites. But from my older sites, what I can see um, is the interior of Bangladesh is, you know, we see very slow subsidence on the order of a millimeter a year. We can see very high rates of subsidence in uh, due to groundwater pumping. pumping. Um, and here in the eastern part, you know, three millimeters a year um, is similar to the rates that Salim got from looking at the Holocene scale. And the same thing with the, um, with the historic sites over here, three and a half and four. Um, but what you see is these other GPSs uh, showing closer to five, six, seven millimeters a year is showing more rapid subsidence in the muddier parts of the Delta. I think there's some additional compaction going on that's producing that. Uh, the surface elevation table she has by in near Polder 32, in an even higher rate, suggesting that, um, you know, since this is, is, is on a school building, um, there may be some very, very low uh, compaction happening in the very near surface that we're not capturing in the GPS. Uh, so here you can see, well, skip over that. So, uh, this January, starting in January through March, we uh, discovered that there's a network of benchmarks that look like this around Bangladesh, and we identified 55 of them um, in, uh, in, our, in our field area. And here you can see us doing a campaign GPS of putting a, a GPS we put on for 24 hours. And these sites were installed in 2002. And so we have an 18 year difference between when they were installed and when they are put in. And I'm still in the process of processing the data. Um, right now it looks like, you know, some of the stations are probably not stable, subsided into the sediment and are giving, you know, unrealistically high rates. Uh, but the rates look like there's fairly low rates, sort of the millimeter a year in, in this area, um, in the Northwest, where the sediments are sandier, and they increase as you go to Southeast, but they increase to probably 10 to 15 millimeters a year is what it's looking like right now. That may change. Uh, so a little bit closer to the, the rates that the uh, SET is getting, so that the suggestion is, is um, you know, shallow subsidence that these GPS are not uh, are not capturing, and perhaps our one that's not on a building over here uh, will will capture that. Um, and so those are that's still in progress, and we still probably want to do some some repeat measurements and observations in that in those area. Um, 
And so, you know, right now in Bangladesh, um, there's enough sediment coming in that sedimentation rates are on the order of a centimeter a year in here. So um, while there is rapid subsidence to go with the sea level rise, there is also sufficient sediment to help it, you know, pretty much keep pace. And in fact, the mouth is still growing. Um, however, for the future, both India and China are planning on on building dams upstream. One that was built, partially built in Assam, but protests from Assam, or sorry, built in Arunachal Pradesh, but Assam, which is down, um, had enough protests, they halted construction. Uh, meanwhile, India is also planning on building an interlink system, redoing the plumbing of their rivers, and so diverting sediment, diverting rivers from the Brahmaputra into the Ganges. Uh, and so, you know, there's a question of, as they do this, what will that do to the sediment supply? And um, because if the sediment supplies, its fate is going to become like the Mekong in Mississippi. And so, you know, right now the question is um, what uh, what will the future hold for Bangladesh um, between its past as a forest, present, or, or future? Um, and this is true of many of the rivers around the world where, um, you know, climate change is contributing, but right now the biggest effect is uh, influence of humans on the uh, uh, on the sediment on the you know sediment supply um, also induced uh, subsidence from groundwater pumping. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we got to turn on our audio and everything. To the <laughs> yeah, yeah, turn on everybody's <laughs> audio. Wow, that was just a, an incredible summary of different deltas, natural anthropogenic effects. You know, you gave us a whole world tour there. Um, and yeah. so, um, just incredible. From Holland to Southeast Asia, Mississippi. And so, um, so uh, just, just a lot of things to, to yeah. cover. And um, just really enjoyed what you were uh, saying about you know, all the different effects. Uh, I know that the students and faculty just learned a lot. So I would like to open it up to questions. You know, thank you. Um, but I know it ran a bit over, a bit long, but you know, well, it's hard to the world I was, in. I was taking notes the whole entire time, you know, that those slides were amazing. Uh, and so I would like to open it up to questions um, and um, to um, the faculty and students, um, people who feel confident about turning on the microphone, you can ask Mike a question, but um, at the same time, or you can just type it in. Hey, Steve, in the interest of time, yes. can I suggest that we uh, hold the floor open for our students first? Oh, yeah, I love that idea. I love that idea. So students, um, especially some of the graduate students, we've already discussed uh, the paper, but uh, they already made up some questions. Who would like to volunteer a question um, and present it to Mike? Okay, they're probably feverishly typing. And you, you can uh, just use your microphone. So uh, I have a question, actually. I'll turn on the camera. Hi, hi everyone. Okay. Um, so with that, with the, the work that Boomer did, um, or I guess Boomer and, and mm -hmm. others, so in 2020, they released a new paper, um, or at least a current, and they saw that most of the um, sedimentation that was coming in and most of the ground level rise was associated with places that were already relatively high, like the, the banks of, of the rivers. So I, I guess first question there is, do you think that'll have an effect on the segmentation of the islands in the Sundarbans that you talked about in the beginning? Um, you know, perhaps actually the most recent measurement by the coast in Katka um, that they had, but it's only one measurement, actually had the interior with sedimentation and by the bank um, did not have any sedimentation. But, you know, we need to, keep uh, keep going. COVID has disrupted, you know, the spring 
measurements and hopefully the student, the Bangladeshi students are going out this fall um, to make the measurements. The, um, yeah, I mean, it's gonna take a few years till we get, you know, measurements from this distributed network. Uh, you know, it's basically from, looked at the ones around October 32, which were installed a few years ago. Um, and is seeing, you know, this, this higher rate and, um, you know, I, I think that that may be right. And there may be a lot of variable in the rates depending on what the underlying sediments are. So, you know, in fact, you know, I'm thinking about things like, you know, going out with Carol Wilson and, you know, all around all those GPS sites to see what the underlying sediments is. We're getting Steve Goodbread to drill uh, some of his, his, you know, 90 meter tube wells and trying to you know, understand better you know, what's controlling the uh, um, subsidence. You know, it's, it's, there's certainly a, a, a large compactional component. It, it seems like it would make a big difference too. If, it's, if it is being restricted to the banks and it's kind of making these higher natural levees, then you're gonna have less avulsions over time, right? You're gonna have less overbank deposits in, in the rest of the area. So there's less sedimentation there even rising, rising sedimentation along the channels, right. in, everywhere else it could be lower. Yeah, in fact, uh, Liz Chamberlain has been uh, using, you know, OA looking at river migration rates and trying, and also trying to see whether or not, you know, there's enough floodplain set to uh, slow down the abortion rates. And right now she's finding that yes, um, there probably is enough sediment that's just right at the river but extending a little bit farther to affect uh, what the uh, what the evolution rates are in the smaller channels okay any other questions I don't see anyone typing yet uh, I'm not oh. <laughs> Godfrey? yes I'll only ask one for the sake of time and the other students as I, was, as I read the paper last evening, I learned a lot and I learned that humans have made a lot of changes to the topography and the sediments and the rest of it. And doing a class early with one of the other professors, I learned that the moment the industrial era began, which was around in the 1950s, uh, there was a lot of increase in like human activity and the how the how the, how the how our natural surroundings responded. So I want to know why is it that they haven't the, there's this push for the seem to be added to the geological time scale. Why is it that it hasn't been accepted as yet? You know, and, yeah, I'm not, I I actually has been officially accepted. Um, I know there's been a lot of debate about it, and there's also questions as to if you define a new geologic period, what do you pick as the starting point of it? Okay. Is it at, you know, say, you know, 1600 or 1750? And, and there's been, you know, multiple suggestions and debates about, you know, where is the beginning of the Anthropocene since, you know, humans impact has been, you know, slowly, you know, increasing through time. And so it's hard to put a, a a spike on exactly on the exact time. All right, thank you. Good question. I have a question for Max. He's wondering if the rates of subsidence are significantly different than past rates. How can we know that the changes now are significantly compared to past errors? Um, well, there is uh, when you you know it depends on the, the time you're you're looking at. It. I mean, for at least looking at the few hundred year scale, I don't have enough to do anything with statistics, but there is a, a known thing called the Sadler effect that as you look at longer and longer time periods, sediment accumulation rates um, up decrease. And part of that is due to the incompleteness of the record. You know, so if you measure at a current, you know, at the current river mouth, you can see very rapid accumulation of sediment, but then that river is going to move and deposit somewhere else and not deposit in the original place. And then it's going to come back. And then, you know, when you average over time, uh, a lower average long-term rates. 
And so, you know, in general, rates uh, decrease with the longer the time frame. Of it. And so you have to account for that to see whether or not there's actual, you know, real changes in the in in the physical properties controlling the rates um, as well. That's a great question too. Um, anybody else? Because um, I, I have a, a question of, of almost a personal nature. You can say, back in the early '90s when I was taking a class with Ken Miller or something like that on uh, subsidence and backstripping and things like that. Um, uh, when we were learning about the Mississippi Delta, because that's a great um, place to talk about water depths, relative sea level, and used to see. Mm -hmm. And and actually, I, I took a look at the Delta, um, and I said, why don't they just cut out south of New Orleans a uh, new river channel? And and you, you're, um, so my question to you is, is that just proposal? They're going to really do that? They're really going to do that. And, you know, they're they're you know there is a whole. Um, Louisiana Delta, you know, Delta plan that's, you know, going through a lot of stages. And I think, I think they're at the, the process of beginning to get, you know, trying to get permissions to do, to do this. And that you know, be tied up into courts for, for some number of years before they can, they can do it. Yeah. And there are things like, you know, because things like, you know, Plaquemine Parish in, you know, on that bird's foot, Right. you know, actually purposely put in a lot of infrastructure and industry so yeah. that couldn't be abandoned. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of dynamics and, and politics in terms of what, you know, how quickly things will, yeah, just, uh, will move. But, you know, the, yeah, you, you can't maintain, you know, the current Mississippi with, with, exactly. with half the sediments. Yeah. And uh, so, 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 so when I saw that, I go, it's about time. Because it's, um, you know, if, if a graduate student could see that, that that's an obvious choice, um, you know, the, Louisiana should be seeing that as well. So, so Louis, Louisiana is, is seeing that. Yeah. But, you know, the, the politics of putting it into practice um, <laughs> is, is complicated. I mean, even controlling things like the, you know, fresh water versus salt discharge is is political over people grow you know doing shrimping versus crawfish versus you know fishing uh, wanting different salinities right. um, so it's it's you know tied up with a lot of a uh, lot of businesses and 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 sure okay. you know, and, and i didn't even talk about like the nile delta where you know since the aswan dam has basically you know cut out about 95 percent and it's beginning to see the effects now. Yeah, and uh, you know, I would say that one of the acute effects of it is that uh, the erosion happening at the Nile is starting to expose old structures that subsided during the Roman times. <laughs> so yeah. it's, uh, you know, as a for archeologist, that could be a good thing, you know, so. Right. <laughs> but uh, so I, have a, I have a question or a comment. I think, first of all, um, it was a great talk, Mike. I really enjoyed it. But my comment is that the way we are talking about our planet, only the very, very large um, delta systems such as the Indus or the Yangtze or the Ganges Brahmaputra are surviving nowadays. Yeah. The rest, I mean, is just uh, either due to damming or due to climate change and is uh, losing. Yeah. And uh, plus we're having accelerated sea level rise so yeah. what are we going to do about this? <laughs> there, there's actually, um, Jop Neuenhaus just published a paper recently looking at, at river deltas. And right now he has that the deltas on, on average are still increasing in, in, in land. Some of it is with cutting off of the sediment. Some of the river deltas are going from, from sediment dominated to tidally dominated. And so they're changing their geometry and that's producing some deposition. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, with sea level rise, it's, it's definitely going to be a problem for the, uh, uh, for the future. I remember years ago, you know, working on something in, in, in Europe where someone said for the, for the Rhone that, you know, most of the, of the gravel transport down the Rhone by truck. 
<laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's really uh, really scary. I mean, yeah. there need to be some type of coordination um, for and, land planning. And and there needs to be, but there is also you know of international borders. So, like in Bangladesh, is a downstream you know riparian nation, and so they have no control over what India and China are doing. And thing in the Nile. Um, Ethiopia has just built a dam, you know, upstream, and they, they nearly went to war over over that. Of, yeah. You know, where it was able to control the water flow into into Egypt, which is their lifeblood. Uh, yeah. You know, or the Mekong Delta. You know, China and and Laos are controlling the sediment supply into Vietnam. Yeah, I was really surprised about the about the Indus. Uh, kind of that uh, Pakistan uh, has hold on a lot of its water. And I thought, you know, well, the Indus Delta and Fan are, you know, still heavily programmed, but uh, the, their future might not be as bright. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. I mean, there's basically no terms of life. So, you know, I expect that the coast is going to uh, run into lots of problems with, with erosion and uh, Absolutely, yeah. erosion there because there isn't any, any sediment coming down, just like, you know, the Colorado River Delta, you know, has no sediment at all. Right. And another point also uh, is uh, the um, oil extraction uh, yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico. That That's uh, another issue that should be considered when you're dealing with the Delta, because they have wells yes. uh, right in the coast of uh, Alabama and uh, Louisiana. We, um, yeah, Alex Coco, who I showed a picture of, I think it was Alex, had a, a Sort of looking at, you know, substance rates in Louisiana and and oil and gas extraction, and it's mm -hmm. a beautiful correlation. And so, yeah. you know, after the oil and gas extraction peaked in the seventies, um, you can see the substance rates decreased as well as the as well as the oil and gas <laughs> rates. But, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, in, in in Dhaka, it's you know, in in many cities, you know. I mean, Houston bowl because of water extraction. Right. You know, that's part of why they're having so much trouble with flooding all the time. Is yeah. they're they're now shaped like a bowl. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, are there any more questions? Um, otherwise, uh, you can do a clap or a reaction. <laughs> it was a great talk, Mike. Thank you. I learned a lot. Great right. figures. All right. So. Um, okay. And then, is there anyone that wanted to talk? Yeah, actually, Cecilia wanted to hang on for a, uh, hang yeah. on for a I, can, I can hang on. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Ever. okay. <laughs> I'm just going to mute myself because I, I have some, I have, I'm working with three students in the other room. But uh, Mike, thank you so much for coming and, or, and I coming for virtually being here. <laughs> yeah. um, I know. I, I've still never physically gone, been to uh, Queen's College. You know, <laughs> we have been really not good with Mike here. You know, I know. so okay, look, by the fall of 2021, we'll have you back. Okay. 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 Yeah, we brought him to the, to the gravel center, but uh, you know that has a lot of uh, mixed things, and so I think uh, Queens might be a much better uh, avenue, okay. according yeah. to his area of expertise. So that would be great. Yeah, and yeah. then you know, the Robert and uh, Vitali are both working on the. Bangladesh right now, so. Right, right. Really we're, yeah. we're writing a proposal for offshore. Uh, <laughs> That's right, for the offshore. <laughs> yeah, for, for, you know, the tectonics, which we haven't, yeah. you know, talked about the earthquake hazard that exists. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. as, as, well, I have one slide that has a, a quote saying, in Bangladesh, we have, we have, you know, every hazard known to man except volcanoes. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh. from the subduction zone or in Myanmar. Yeah, that's only in Myanmar. Yeah, that's uh, well, it's a question that the Japanese ask uh, uh, when we were initiating our collaboration with them and they wanted to know if they were ash from the volcanoes in, you know, in the Eastern Bay of Bengal, but in any, so we didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice if there was some ash layers. Yeah, right. <laughs> if 
further south. We have to go to Indonesia. <laughs> 2020 yeah. is not over yet, so there could be volcanoes popping up. Who knows? Yeah, you never know. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, yeah, if you take a look along that, the, the number of volcanoes per kilometer, you know, going from, you know, Java to Sumatra, um, through the Andamans and up into Myanmar is just continually decreasing and decreasing uh, mm -hmm. as the subduction zone becomes more and more oblique. So right. that's why, you know, farther south is where most of the volcanoes are. Right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were just covering the Sunda subduction system today and we were talking about earthquakes, not volcanoes, but yes, earthquakes, but yeah. Right, but then there's, there's volcanoes all over the place and like Myanmar has four subduction volcanoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, maybe Robert had a question too, uh, relative to um, this. We were reading a paper, uh, the, the Barma paper about the 2017 earthquake um, in Trinidad and Basa. And uh, one of the points uh, 